Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. And the first question is number one from Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with local authorities regarding equalities in their employment practices. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding officer, ministers and officials regularly meet the leaders and chief executives of all Scottish local authorities uh, to discuss a variety of issues. At official level, we have also had discussions with local authorities with a view to reaching a consensus uh, on equality issues. We share the vision of the Fair Work Convention that by 2025, uh, people in Scotland will have a world-leading working life where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for individuals, businesses, organisations and society. And this vision challenges not only businesses, employers, unions and the third sector, but also has clear actions for national and local government. And we fully endorse the Convention's framework and will work with them to embed its principles in workplaces across Scotland. Ms. Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you were quite clear that the Government's uh, Fairer Scotland Action Plan features uh, 50 different concrete actions from the Government uh, as to regard to what will happen to tackle poverty and inequality. Uh, could I ask what analysis the Scottish Government has undertaken uh, to advise the costs that will be incurred by local authorities when, they come, when you come to implement this action plan? Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate yeah, Ms Smith's uh, interest in the Fair Scotland Action Plan, which was uh, launched uh, nearly a, a, a month ago. Um, there are 50 uh, concrete actions. They're ambitious, but we are absolutely confident that they are all affordable. And, of course, the 50 action plans uh, aren't all actions for local government. The whole uh, purpose uh, of the Fair Scotland Action Plan uh, is to demonstrate actions uh, that are required uh, by this government, uh, by local government uh, and other aspects of the, the, the public sector and of course there was a, an equality impact uh, assessment done. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary give her views on those councils who in their equalities and employment practices have not yet settled their equal pay claims? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Sign officer, while it is uh, clear and evident that councils are uh, independent and uh, have their uh, own responsibilities towards their own employees, uh, I have to say, and it is the repeated position of this government, that uh, any uh, ongoing delays to settling equal pay claims is totally uh, unacceptable. That is a point that this government uh, has made uh, repeatedly, and indeed I reiterated that position uh, just prior to research uh, and answers uh, to questions in this chamber uh, as uh, well. Uh, Marco Biaggi, uh, when he was previously the local government minister, had indeed written to uh, our colleagues in local government and I have uh, recently also uh, written to uh, local authorities because it is completely unacceptable that as these equal pay claims uh, go back to 2006, or indeed even further, there can't be any justification uh, for taking so long uh, to uh, resolve these. The Equal Pay Act uh, was introduced in 1970. Uh, as a piece of legislation, it is as old uh, as I am, and we know uh, that the pay gap uh, remains stubborn. So uh, all the more reason for uh, local authorities uh, to go on and to settle uh, outstanding uh, equal uh, pay, 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 pay gap uh, claims. And as I said, the, the pay gap uh, is proven to be stubborn, um, although it should be noted, given that we debated it at length yesterday, that uh, new figures uh, released by ONS on the annual survey uh, of hours and earnings show that the pay, gender pay gap in Scotland has again decreased further uh, from 7.7% in 2015 to 6.2% in 2016, uh, lower than the 9.4% uh, UK figure. But nonetheless, uh, any gap uh, remains uh, unacceptable. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Funeral Poverty and Fu Funeral Payment Reference Group. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Funeral Poverty and Funeral Payment Reference Group has met three times over recent months. The group has helped to organise and plan three roundtable events, which I've attended with uh, reference group members, uh, local authorities and funeral industry representatives. 
They are also supporting us to organise a, a national conference on funeral poverty in November. Uh, through this work, the group is helping to shape both their approach to funeral poverty and the new Scottish benefit that will replace the funeral payment. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Minister will be, the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, will be aware of the specific concerns of my constituents here in Edinburgh City who face the highest costs in the whole of Scotland with a basic burial standing at £2,253, with the Scottish average being £1,373. What assessment will the group make of the variations across Scotland in basic burial costs? And in particular, what pressures families across Scotland are facing in areas like mine in Edinburgh? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, sir, I'm very grateful to uh, Mr Briggs for uh, lodging this question because it also gives me the opportunity, as well as uh, answering his uh, very legitimate uh, concerns, it also gives me the opportunity to pay tribute to Alec Neil, uh, as it was my predecessor, Mr Neil, who had uh, commissioned uh, the Working Group on Funeral Poverty, which reported in February uh, this year, uh, which made a number of recommendations which we uh, are currently working through with the assistance of the, the reference group and establishing the reference group was one of the recommendations uh, made by uh, that report. But Mr Briggs uh, makes uh, a very uh, valid point that the, the variation in burial costs and cremation costs uh, is, is quite stark. And while we know that over the past decade, uh, funeral costs uh, overall have risen by 92%, over the past year, the overall costs have had a small decline, but underneath that, we are still seeing uh, rapidly rising uh, cremation and burial costs. So that's why one of the very important roundtables, they were all important, uh, but in particular, uh, our work, our ongoing work uh, with local authorities. Local authorities are indeed uh, independent, but through the roundtables and indeed the national conference, it is imperative that uh, local and national government, uh, along with industry and funeral directors that we actually all work together to resolve the very real issue of funeral poverty which is increasing and most certainly won't be uh, going away given that uh, funeral costs continue to rise and the number of deaths uh, is predicted to rise by 15 percent over the next decade. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK Government's failing to do enough to simplify and promote the funeral payment has resulted in take-up rates remaining shockingly low? Cabinet Secretary. Um, absolutely, I do agree with the member. Um, but it's not just um, my opinion. The issues uh, and problems in and around with the funeral payment as it currently stands um, have been well rehearsed. Uh, I know that uh, these issues were raised with the DWP's um, existing work that they've done. The recent uh, Work and Pensions Committee report uh, on bereavement benefits acknowledged these issues. Uh, and there was also a Westminster debate on social fund and funeral uh, payments. But one of the main issues that we hope to uh, tackle in Scotland and are absolutely determined to tackle, I should add, presiding officer, is indeed the low take-up uh, of the DWP funeral payment, um, and particularly uh, when that is uh, devolved to uh, Scotland. But one of the uh, very important issues that, uh, as the funding uh, when it's transferred to Scotland will be based on the spend in Scotland the year before transfer. We know that the resources transferred won't meet the current need or indeed our desire to increase the reach uh, of, the, of the benefit. And we know that currently around 4,000 people receive a funeral payment uh, in Scotland, but our estimate is that uh, up to 16,000 people uh, are actually in need and could apply uh, for that benefit if we were reaching people who were entitled uh, to, to make the claims. Question number three, Colin Smith. An officer to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting town centre regeneration in South Scotland. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scotland's town centre first pr principle agreed with COSLA, together with the measures set out in the town centre action plan, set the conditions and underpin activity designed to tackle the key issues in town centres across Scotland. The Scottish Government are providing £1.8 million in funding from our Regeneration Capital Fund to support the Stranraer Town Centre Regeneration Initiative. Local authorities remain responsible for local regeneration and local economic development. They are best placed to respond to local circumstances, working with their communities to develop the right vision for their town centres.
Colin Smith. Okay, can I thank the Minister for that answer and ask if he agrees with me that, that the internet shopping, improved transport links to our cities, the rise of supermarkets and outer town developments have left many of our market towns across South Scotland plagued by empty shops and there's a real need to find alternative ways to bring people into our town centres. Now, one important way to achieve that is to invest in more town centre housing, providing, for example, alternative uses for former retail properties. Given the extra cost of developing housing in town centres and often old buildings compared to greenfield sites, will the Minister make a commitment that increasing investment in town centre housing will be a priority in the Government's forthcoming budget so we really can regenerate our town centres? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, well, the Government recognised the importance of uh, town centres uh, and uh, we have delivered things like the small business bonus, uh, which has benefited uh, nearly 100,000 businesses, uh, many of them based in town centres. In terms of housing and delivering affordable housing in our town centres, uh, we have uh, already committed £6.75 million pounds for this. Uh, and that will benefit town centres right across Scotland. Uh, we are building on the learning from the, this test approach to enable more housing to be delivered in our town centres right across the country. Finlay Carson. Thank you, officer. Prior to a meeting I'm holding on Friday with Stena, Dumfries and Galloway Council, Visit Scotland and Sonar business leaders, what reassurance uh, can I give the stakeholders that the Scottish Government will do all they can to assist the Sonar community with the East Pier Regeneration Project? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As I've already stated, uh, the Government have already provided £1.8 million pounds worth of funding uh, from the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund to support uh, Stranraer Town Centre Regeneration Initiative. Um, it's also open to local authorities to, su uh, to support a number of other initiatives uh, by bidding in to the annual £25 million pounds Regeneration Capital Grant Fund that is open to all local authorities in the country. Question number four, Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the energy efficiency of Scotland's housing stock. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President <coughs> Officer. Uh, since 2009, we have allocated over £650 million on a raft of energy efficiency and fuel poverty programmes. And in the programme for government, we announced that we will make available a further half a billion pounds over the next four years. Our investment is helping to improve the energy performance of Scotland's homes. The share of homes with the top three energy efficiency ratings has increased by 71% since 2010. Donald Cameron. Um, one of the key issues is the um, warmth of homes, and I wonder if the um, Cabinet Secretary can make any comments about the oncoming winter and the warmth of homes in the future. Minister. Yes, well, President Officer, uh, I've already outlined the um, government's uh, investment uh, that we are making, have made and will make over future years. Um, we've carried out over a million different actions in a million homes uh, in recent years. Um, I would be interested to hear um, from Mr Cameron and the Tory benches what they think about the UK government who has ended its support uh, for the Green Deal Finance uh, Initiative, uh, which we received £15 million of consequentials for in 2015-16. That is money that is now no longer available to us uh, because of that UK government cut. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister what plans he has to respond to the recommendations of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group and the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force reports, which were published earlier this week? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, obviously, the Government will look very closely at the recommendations uh, by uh, both uh, of those uh, committees, and I thank them very much um, for the efforts that they have put in. Um, one of the things which uh, I have said already uh, is that we will look very clearly at the definition uh, of fuel poverty. That is not to define uh, fuel poverty away. That is to make sure that we as a government target our resources at those folks who are most in need. Liam MacArthur. 
very much indeed. I've listened with interest to what the Minister uh, said in relation to the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force uh, report. You'll be aware that the proportion of households living in fuel poverty and extreme fuel poverty is highest in my Orkney uh, constituency. Um, the task force itself has talked about rural proofing uh, the approach to, to tackling this issue. What reassurance can you give uh, my constituents that the approach the government will take in terms of deploying that investment will prioritise those areas which at the moment have the highest levels of fuel poverty and the highest level of need? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As I said in my previous answer, um, what the government wants to do is to make sure that resources are targeted at those most in need. Um, I will see, I think, firsthand for myself very soon uh, what the situation is uh, in Orkney. Um, I intend to visit Orkney in the very near future, and on the itinerary um, is discussion round about fuel poverty uh, in Orkney. Question number five, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what additional support from the Council Tax Reduction Scheme it will provide from April 2017 for families in the Musselburgh Job Centre area who have migrated to universal credit. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone who currently receives Council Tax Reduction support will continue to be eligible if they are in receipt of universal credit. In addition, our proposed reforms to Council Tax will make local taxation fairer and continue to protect households on low incomes, including those in receipt of universal credit. Ian Gray. Um, I welcome the answer from the Minister, but Spice's information is rather different that uh, the Council Tax Reduction Scheme increases due in April will not apply to those families who have migrated to universal credit. I'd be grateful if the Minister would investigate and perhaps uh, tell us how this can be uh, uh, corrected. Yes. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for drawing that to my attention. That is certainly not my understanding. Indeed, um, my uh, understanding is that the Council Tax Reduction Scheme uh, will benefit uh, up to 77,000 households by an average of £173 a year uh, by increasing uh, child allowance within that scheme by 25%. So I most definitely will take uh, Mr Gray's point on board, investigate uh, the apparent disparity in figures and uh, report back to you. Ben McPherson. Thank you. Does the Minister agree with me that universal credit is not yet fit for purpose and should be halted until it's in a state that can actually support people and not cause further financial hardship? Minister. Well, yes, I do. It is extremely disappointing, presiding officer, that a scheme announced in 2010 uh, is not yet rolled out and indeed the latest completion date is 2022. I can only imagine if the Scottish Government ever took so long to do something, the criticisms we might hear from some of my colleagues uh, on my left, at least geographically. Um, we have expressed our concerns over the rollout of universal credit for a considerable time and we did call on the DWP to halt the rollout in Scotland until they are in a position to bring in the Scottish flexibilities around universal credit, which of course are part of the benefits that will be devolved to us, those flexibilities. Unfortunately, we've not been successful in that, uh, but we do believe that the opportunity we will have when that opportunity comes around to give people a choice on how their universal credit is paid will help people in a uh, considerable manner. Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government whether there will be an appropriate level of staff to assist with those expected to receive help with the migration. Minister. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. It seems to me that question is best directed by one of uh, the Member's Westminster colleagues to uh, the DWP, because it will, of course, be the DWP who are currently responsible for the rollout of universal credit. The, um, uh, concocted the scheme and the, the proposition and the benefit itself and I can only but imagine although we, of course we don't get this information from DWP uh, exactly what it might be that is holding them up on this um, but clearly there are issues around staffing and other IT matters and uh, I'd look forward to hearing uh, the member the response the member gets from the DWP when her Westminster colleagues put that point. Question number six Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met local government representatives from the Central Scotland Parliamentary Region. 
Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Ministers regularly meet uh, the leaders and chief executives of all Scottish local authorities, including those in central Scotland, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Uh, as the member will know, Councillor Harry McGuigan of North Lanarkshire Council is the COSLA spokesperson, and I have met with him on a number of occasions recently in this capacity. For that very comprehensive answer, uh, but he'll be aware that councils like North Lanarkshire operate a community alarm system which enables elderly people to remain independent within their home. However, as from August 2016, budgetary constraints have been cited for the decision by North Lanarkshire Council to set a £5 a week, £20 a month charge. As a result, hundreds of these alarms have been returned. Does the Minister agree that this is not only deeply worrying, but is also putting vulnerable people at risk? And it also represents a very short-sighted decision which fails to recognise the preventative spend advantage of providing these alarms free of charge. Yes. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, obviously, uh, budgetary decisions are a, a matter for North Lanarkshire uh, Council itself. However, uh, I do agree uh, with the member that in taking decisions, um, councils should look at prevention, and I do feel that that is preventative spend. Um, I, I would urge um, North Lanarkshire Council uh, to maybe take cognizance of what government has said previously uh, about preventative spending, but ultimately um, the budgetary decision is up to North Lanarkshire Council itself. Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Presiding Officer, I would agree that these alarm systems are a good idea and preventative, uh, for preventative measures, but I wonder if the Minister, given that he represents local government across the whole of, uh, given he's the Minister of Local Government across the whole of Scotland, could tell us how many other councils operate these alarm systems and how much they charge? Minister. I don't have that uh, information to hand, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, but I'm willing to write to Miss Smith and let her know. Alec Rowley. Thank you. I think the, the Minister makes a point about difficult decisions. What discussions is he having with local authorities about the type of difficult decisions that they face? I know that in Fife, the community alarm system was introduced, the payment for community alarm was introduced some time ago when his own party was in power as a budget decision at that time. Councils are facing massive cuts and we're seeing that in services. What discussions is he having about the impact to the cuts? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I know that uh, colleagues are speaking to local government on a regular basis. Um, Finance uh, Secretary uh, Derek Mackay is having regular meetings with COSLA at this moment in time um, uh, about the forthcoming budget. Uh, of course, uh, we are still not completely sure uh, of what is going to happen in that regard uh, because we are waiting still on the Chancellor's autumn statement, uh, which is more likely to be a, a winter statement now rather than an autumn one. Question number seven, Maurice Golden. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that the implementation of the national planning framework protects biodiversity as well as green spaces. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. National Planning for Framework 3 is clear that biodiversity is a nationally important asset. Planning authorities are legally obliged to take the National Planning Framework into account when preparing development plans for their area. Morris Golden. Thank you for that answer. But is the Minister aware that an SNP government appointed reporter has recommended building on more than a dozen greenbelt sites across East Dumbartonshire? Residents will be rightly concerned about the impact of such developments will have on the character of their communities, on biodiversity and on the local landscape. Will the Minister agree to work with the local community to look at these proposals again to ensure that any development plans properly reflect the views of local residents and allow Eastern Bartonshire to continue to support a wide range of green spaces. Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, there are extensive opportunities for local communities to get involved in the preparation of development plans. 
Uh, and I am keen to ensure that the review of planning and the forthcoming white paper add uh, to that those list of opportunities. Um, in terms of uh, the East Dumbartonshire, Dumbartonshire situation at the moment, um, the independent examination of the plan has made recommendations to East Dumbartonshire Council suggesting the release of additional site. It's now up to the Council uh, to consider these recommendations and following that to submit the plan to Scottish Ministers. Uh, as the plan will come to Ministers in due course, I cannot comment on any individual areas. Question number eight, Jeremy Balfour. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to tackle claimant abuse of the welfare powers that are being devolved. Minister G. Freeman. <clears throat> Thank you. The Scottish Government intends that our social security system will operate on the basis that people have a right to support and care where and when it's needed without being stigmatised or treated as potential abusers of the system. Nonetheless, of course, the Scottish Government has a zero tolerance attitude to intentional fraud and we are currently seeking views on how we can best protect against fraud as part of the consultation on social security. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Last week, ONS labour market statistics showed that the claimant count over the last year was down over 8,000 in England, 2,000 in Wales and almost 6,000 in Northern Ireland, but in Scotland was up by 2,000. Can the Minister explain to the Chamber why Scotland is the only UK nation to have a rise in the claimant count? Minister. I would say to the member that at least part of the rise in the claimant count is um, indeed in some of the work that we are effectively doing in encouraging individuals to claim the benefits that they are entitled to. And with respect to the idea that those who seek help and support from our social security system or indeed the UK government's welfare system uh, are abusers of that system. I would just like to lay on record the fact that in terms of the GWP's most recent uh, statistics for 2014-15, um, the level of fraud in uh, the benefit system is 0.8%, that is 80 pence in every 100 pounds that are uh, uh, spent totalling about £1.3 billion, and I would like us to just pause and compare that, indeed, to the £16 billion that cost the country in terms of tax fraud. Mm, Fulton McGregor. The Minister may have seen the heartbreaking appeal from a mother in my constituency at the weekend, who has had her benefits sanctioned for four months, leaving her un unable to buy food for or clothes or nappies for her child. While the actions of the Lanarkshire Baby Bank and Coatbridge Citizens Advice Bureau in supporting this family should be applauded, does the Minister agree with me that no family should be put in this situation? Minister. Thank you. I have seen the article in the Evening Times and I agree that while it is heartening to see the generosity with which the people of North Lanarkshire and Coatbridge responded, with over 200 of them coming forward uh, within an hour of the video appearing online to offer help and support, uh, to this mother and her two-year-old. They were offering help and support to an individual who'd been placed in a dire predicament uh, which the GWP uh, had forced her into. The tragedy here, unfortunately, is that this is by no means an isolated incident. The Scottish Government has made uh, its position on sanctions abundantly clear. We are told, and they are justified by the UK Government, that sanctions incentivise work. On the contrary, there is no evidence of that at all, but the evidence that does exist is that sanctions actually increase poverty and the anguish that people uh, suffer. So that is why we supported the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee uh, call last year for a full and independent review of the system, and it's why we continue to believe that the current sanctions regime should be suspended. It is indeed a discredited system. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder if the Minister would agree with me that rather than treating people with suspicion who uh, desperately need support from the state, that actually we should be working to boost the claimant count, including the 100,000 people who qualify for tax credits and who haven't applied, which represents a loss of over £400 million to families who desperately need it and the Scottish economy. Minister. 
Thank you. I absolutely do agree with the member. And indeed, part of uh, our work in social security and in the consultation is to look at what we need to do across Scotland to increase the information that individuals have on the benefits that they are entitled to and encourage and support them to take up those benefits, whether or not they are delivered and administered by the UK government or very shortly by the Scottish government. So I know that I will have the members' support in working out exactly how we do that and making sure that people across Scotland receive the entitlements that they are due. Question 9 has been withdrawn. Question 10, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will ring fence funding for supported accommodation in local housing alliance when this is devolved. Minister Jean Freeman. After much uncertainty on the 15th of September, the UK Government announced that they will ensure that the supported accommodation sector will continue to be funded at current levels. A new funding model will be developed in England and funding will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament to allow us to make our own provision for supported accommodation from 2019. We are still waiting on further information and details from the UK Government, but we will make our own plans known when we have had the opportunity to consider the full information and consulted with the relevant stakeholders. Elaine Smith. Thanks. President Officer, and can I thank the Minister for that response? But um, I do hope that she can appreciate that there is concern that money could be reduced further or allocated elsewhere. And I trust that the Minister, in taking this forward, will keep stakeholders informed, both individuals and the industry as it goes forward. Minister. Uh, indeed, I will. And as I've said, uh, once we've received the details uh, from the UK government, we'll consider our plans and consult with relevant stakeholders before we bring those forward. Question number 11, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards the full implementation of the Town Centre Action Plan. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Town Centre Action Plan has been implemented in full and a number of actions have been taken that set the right conditions to enable town centre regeneration across Scotland. The most significant action has been the introduction of the town centre first principle that was agreed by the Scottish Cabinet and COSLA leaders in July 2014. We have published two reports showing the wide range of activity against the themes in the action plan since its inception. Neil Bowie. Thank the Minister for that answer. The face of our town centres is changing. We have a once in a generation opportunity to reinvent town centres as mixed, connected, socially inclusive places of living. The decisive shift we need from development led by developers to sustainable development in our towns for our towns will not be achieved by pilots and demonstration projects, but by making town centre living mainstream. In response to Colin Smith, the minister mentioned the small amounts uh, being invested by the Scottish Government. But like Colin Smith, can I ask what resources are the Scottish Government willing to put behind town centre living and what kind of investment in town centre living can we expect in next year's budget? Yes. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I say that I'm heartened by the amount of questions that have appeared today uh, about town centres, and I think that may be partly due to the fact that uh, Scotland's town cent uh, Towns Partnership held an event here hosted by John Scott in, in recent weeks. Um, can I say that um, uh, we are investing in our town centres? As I said, in terms of the housing delivery, £6.75 million uh, has already been put into that. Local authorities have the ability, as I've said previously, uh, to uh, bid into the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Uh, and beyond that, we have the £1.7 million town centre communities capital fund. But as I've said already, you know, um, regeneration of town centres and economic development in these town centres are primarily a matter for local authorities. Uh, and they need to adapt policies, particularly their own planning guidance, to ensure that there are opportunities to build housing uh, and other things in our town centres. Question number 12, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase the role of local authorities and communities directly in public service decision making. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. We are continuing to implement the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, which will strengthen the voices of communities in the decisions that matter to them. 
The Act will make it easier for communities to take on public sector land and buildings. It will provide a mechanism for community bodies to seek dialogue with public service providers on their terms when they feel that they can help to improve outcomes and gives them a right to be heard. And it will place new duties on councils and other local public services to work together and with their communities through community planning in order to improve outcomes and issues that matter locally. Just Scott. Well, I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware of the cause of the report two years ago, which stated that Scotland is the most centralised government in Europe. Since then, health and social care has been integrated with less input and control now exercised by local authorities than ever before. Police and fire services are already centralised, and now funding for the attainment fund is to be taken from local authority budgets as well. Will there be a future or even a need for local authorities and local decision making at all in five years' time? And if, the, and if so, can the Minister tell us what that will be? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. This Government is committed to giving communities across Scotland a louder voice and stronger powers. And our commitment goes beyond the Community Empowerment Act. Uh, and that uh, is, lies at the heart of our approach to public sector uh, service reform. Um, as Mr Scott is well aware, uh, we will be introducing a bill during the course of this parliament to decentralise local authority functions, budgets and democratic oversight to local communities. We'll be consulting on and bringing forward an islands bill to reflect the unique needs of these communities and we'll be enabling community councils <laughs> to demonstrate a strong democratic mandate to deliver some services. Um, also, working with local government, we've set a target of having at least 1% of their budget subject to community choices budgeting. And that will be over £100 million that people will have a direct say in how it is spent. I think it is, uh, it is incumbent in all of us to ensure that communities have their say uh, and the public services uh, that, uh, th that they have. Uh, and in his own community uh, of South Ayrshire, uh, we've recently granted £191,000 uh, the, from the Communities Fund uh, to help support programmes for young people there uh, who are living in some of the most deprived areas. And also, he will be aware um, that the Carrick Centre in Maybo has benefited from over £53,000 in grant funding from Strengthening Communities Programme. That is decentralisation. Question number 13, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how proposals in its new Social Security Bill could benefit carers. Sir Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Unpaid carers play a vital role in caring for their family, friends and neighbours. And we have already committed to increasing carers' allowance so that it is paid at the same level as job seekers' allowance. That is an increase of almost 18%, and eligible carers will each get around £600 more per year. We are currently undertaking a wide-ranging consultation on Social Security that finishes this coming weekend. And I myself uh, am pleased to say that I was at one such event this morning with carers where I am listening to them and others in receipt of benefits that we will be responsible for to take their views on how we can best create a Social Security system that is fit for Scotland. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer and for her uh, attendance at the recent uh, Carers Cross Party Group meeting, which covered this very subject. That CPG discussion raised a number of important issues in the relation to the Bill from a Carers perspective. Can I ask the Minister if, as we move forward, she will ensure uh, carers are involved as far as they can be in shaping the new social security system in order that we emerge from that process with something that better supports them and those they care for than the present UK arrangements? Minister. Thank you. I thank the member for that additional question because it allows me the opportunity to put on record in the chamber that our approach to the consultation, which is one of, of listening and talking to those with direct experience of the benefits that we will take responsibility for, as well as those who advise and support them, the many organisations involved and indeed those who deliver payments across Scotland, is an approach that we will continue when the consultation ends uh, uh, this weekend. And so we were, are absolutely committed to designing with those individuals 
uh, the future system for social security in Scotland, working through the interrelationships between the 15% that we will be responsible for and the remaining 85% that will stay with the UK Government and DWP, and looking to uh, advice, support uh, and indeed advocacy services that will enable individuals both to take up the benefits that they're entitled to, but to experience a system that is genuinely living the values of dignity, fairness and respect. Question 14, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how it empowers communities to have more of a say in matters that affects them. Cabinet Secretary. The Government has taken a number of actions to empower communities. With this Parliament, we developed the Community Empowerment Act to give communities new rights. We also established the £20 million Empowering Communities Fund, which gives local groups the money and support they need to make changes happen eh, on their own terms. And as part of this fund, we launched the Community Choices Programme in June this year. And this will support thousands of people to have a real say in budget decisions in their areas. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Would she agree that the communities situated on Scotland's trunk roads, for example, Cairn Ryan and Spring Home, should pay, play a pivotal role in the decision-making process regarding planning and implementation of traffic calming schemes? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign off, I think aspects of that question are perhaps would have been better directed at the Transport Minister, but in terms of the planning uh, aspects, uh, obviously we had an independent uh, planning review and as part of the, the uh, wide uh, range of recommendations from, from that uh, planning uh, review, uh, we did say that we needed to include uh, ways, identify ways to improve uh, the strengthening of community engagement uh, in plan and decision making and the, the planning minister uh, will be consulting on various options for change over the winter. Thank the minister and members and we'll move on to the next item of business.